this is on the words maker of heaven and earth on the words of the creed maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible and it starts off with a quote from job chapter 38 verses 2 to 3 who is this that hideth counsel from me and keepeth words in his heart and thinketh to hide them from me and this is saint Kirill. to look upon god with eyes of flesh is impossible for the incorporeal cannot be subject to bodily sight and the only begotten son of god himself hath testified saying no man hath seen god at any time for if according to that which is written in Ezekiel, anyone should understand that Ezekiel saw him, yet what saith the scripture? He saw the likeness of the glory of the Lord, not the Lord himself, but the likeness of his glory, not the glory itself as it really, not the glory itself as it really is. And when he saw merely the likeness of the glory and not the glory itself, he fell to the earth from fear. Now, if the sight of the likeness of the glory brought fear and distress upon the prophets, anyone who should attempt to behold God himself would to a certainty lose his life, according to the saying, no man shall see my face and live. For this cause, God of his great, long, long, uh, of his great loving kindness spread out the heaven as a veil of his proper Godhead, that we should not perish. The word is not mine, but the prophet's. If thou shalt rend the heavens, trembling will take hold of the mountains at sight of thee, and they will flow down. And why dost thou wonder that Ezekiel fell down on seeing the likeness of the glory? When Daniel at the sight of Gabriel, though but a servant of God, straightway shuddered and fell on his face, and, prophet as he was, dared not to answer him, until the angel transformed himself into the likeness of a son of man. Now if the appearing of Gabriel wrought trembling in the prophets, had God himself been seen as he is, would not all have perished. The divine nature then is it is impossible to see with eyes of flesh. But from the works which are divine, it is possible to attain to some conception of his power, according to Solomon, who says, For by the greatness and beauty of the creatures proportion, proportionably the maker of them is seen. He said not that from the creatures the maker is seen, but added proportionably. For God appears the greater to every man in proportion as he has grasped a larger survey of the creatures. And when his heart is uplifted by that larger survey, he gains with he gains with all a greater conception of God. The translator uses the word nature. Uh, this is certainly not nature, as we say that Christ has two natures. Uh, he's fully God and fully man. Uh, the word they're talking about is essence, uh, usia, as opposed to energy, uh, energy. Uh, so, um, yeah, we should have that in mind that uh, what he means by nature here is essence. This is the, the essence of God that is uh, unapproachable for us. Um, thank you, that's but uh, Wouldst thou learn that to co comprehend the nature of God is impossible? The three children in the furnace of fire, as they hymn the praises of God, say, Blessed art thou that beholdest the depths, and sittest upon the cherubim. Tell me, tell me what is the nature of the cherubim, and then look upon him who sitteth upon them. And yet Ezekiel the prophet even made a description of them as far as was possible, saying that everyone has four faces, one of a man, another of a lion, another of an eagle, and another of a calf, and that each one had six wings, and they had eyes on all sides, and that under each one was a wheel of four sides. Nevertheless, though the prophet makes the explanation, we cannot yet understand it even as we read. But if we cannot understand the throne which he has described, how shall we be able to comprehend him who sitteth thereon, the invisible and ineffable God? To scrutinize then the nature of God is impossible, but it is in our power to send up praises of his glory for his works that are seen. These things I say to you because of the following context of the creed, and because we say we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, in order that we may remember that the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the same as he that made the heaven and the earth, 
and that we may make ourselves safe against the wrong paths of the godless heretics who have dared to speak evil of the all-wise artificer of all this world, men who see with eyes of flesh but have, their, but have the eyes of their understanding blinded. For what fault have they to find with the vast creation of God? They who ought to have been struck with amazement on beholding the vaultings of the heavens. They who ought to have worshipped him who reared the sky as a dome, who out of the fluid nature of the waters formed the stable substance of the heaven. For God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the water. God spake once for all, and it stands fast and falls not. The heaven is water, and the orbs therein, sun, moon, and stars, are of fire. And how do the orbs of fire run their course in the water? But if anyone disputes this because of the opposite natures of fire and water, let him remember the fire which in the time of Moses in, in Egypt flamed amid the hail, and observe the all-wise workmanship of God. For since there was need of water, because the earth was to be tilled, he made the heaven above of water, that when the region of the earth should need watering by showers, the heaven might from its nature be ready for this purpose. But what? Is there not cause to wonder when one looks at the constitution of the sun? For being to the sight, as it were, a small body, he contains a mighty power, appearing from the east and sending forth his light unto the west whose rising at dawn the psalmist described, saying, And he cometh forth out of his chamber as a bridegroom. He was describing the brightness and moderation of his state on first becoming visible unto men. For when he rides at high noon, we often flee from his blaze. But at his rising, he is welcome to all as a bridegroom to look on. Observe also his arrangement, or rather not his, but the arrangement of him who of him who by an ordinance determined his cause, how in summer he rises higher and makes the days longer, giving men good time for their works, but in winter contracts his course that the period, period of cold may be increased and that the nights becoming longer may contribute to men's rest and contribute also to the fruitfulness of the products of the earth. Uh, St. Cyril is very poetic in this and very beautiful. Look how God has made everything. He's made uh, time for more work, and that goes together with um, the with planting, reaping, um, the gardens, this. And he's uh, made another time of the year to be um, the days to be shorter uh, for men to find rest and, and solace. Uh, the summer has the heat and the long day to produce, and the autumn and the winter has the shorter days and for rest. So uh, we're getting a, an image that uh, in all things, uh, God has ordained everything uh, for our good and uh, a peaceful uh, harmony of the different times of the year. Uh, as the Old Testament says, uh, a time for each, uh, thing, a season for each thing. Thank you, Espada. See also how the days altern alternately respond each to other in due order, in summer increasing and in winter diminishing, but in spring and autumn but granting equal intervals one to another. And the nights again complete the like courses, so that the psalmist also says of them, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night proclaimeth knowledge. For to the heretics who have no ears, they all cry, they all but cry aloud, and by their good order say that there is none other God save the Creator who hath set them who hath set them their bounds and laid out the order of the universe. But let no one tolerate any any who say that one is the creator of the light and another of darkness. For let him remember how Isaiah says, I am the God who made the light and created darkness. Why, O man, art thou vexed thereat? Why art thou offended at the time that is given thee for rest? A servant would have had no rest from his masters, had not the darkness necessarily brought a respite. And often after wearying ourselves in the day, how are we refreshed in the night? And he who was yesterday worn with toils rises vigorous in the morning because of the night's rest. And what more helpful to wisdom than the night? 
For herein oftentimes we set before our minds the things of God, and herein we read and contemplate the divine oracles. And when is our mind most attuned to psalmody in prayer? Is it not at night? And when have we and when have we often called our own sins to remembrance? Is it not at night? Let us not then admit the evil thought that another is the maker of darkness, for experience shows that this also is good and useful. St. Cyril here um, speaks about the night for prayer. This is a theme in many fathers, and especially in St. John Chrysostom, that the night is the perfect time for prayer. Um, it's when a person settles down, and I would say it's a perfect time for us and maybe after Compline or whatever we're reading in the evening, uh, evening prayers, um, to really speak to God. Besides the evening prayers that we read, um, we should, uh, in the evening, um, look at ourselves, what we did during the day, and um, if I may be so bold as to say it, uh, to speak with Christ, to tell Christ, uh, besides the prayers that we've read, to tell Christ that this, these are my needs, and let's concentrate on spiritual needs. These are my needs. This is what I did during the day. Um, uh, my love for you remains. Um, forgive whatever I did wrong. Uh, these are the kinds of ways we should embellish, I think, what we've read and continue into the night with thoughts of God, thoughts of repentance, and uh, um, evaluating our, our day and evaluating our actions. Thank you, this one. They ought to have felt astonishment and admiration, not only at the arrangement of sun and moon, but also at the well-ordered choirs of the stars, their unimpeded courses, and their risings in the seasons due to each, and how, and how some are signs of summer and others of winter, and how some mark the season for sowing and others show the commence, commencement of navigation. And a man sitting in his ship and sailing amid the boundless waves steers his ship by looking at the stars. For of these matters the scripture says well, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for years, not for fables of astrology and nativities. But observe how he has also graciously given us the light of day by gradual increase. For we do not see the sun at, at once arise, but just a little light runs on before, in order that the pupil of the eye may be enabled by previous trial to look upon his stronger beam. See also how he has relieved the darkness of the night by rays of moonlight. And I think we will stop here. This is the halfway point of this lecture and we'll resume it next week. Uh, and did you guys have any other thoughts to share? Again, I look at the atheists and I say, how can they not see a creator? All these things that St. Cyril is talking about are the glories of a creator. Uh, did you ever stop to think that the sun doesn't come out bam at once the sun comes up slowly it, it brings us into the time of work the time of labor and the sun also goes down slowly uh, to cause us to relax some um, to let go of the works of the day and start to uh, ponder on uh, on our soul uh, and on our very being, on our end, uh, just like there's an end to a day, there's our end. So the atheists are not even, they're not even able to um, understand creation, uh, what exists. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. Is there anything more beautiful than the way God has made the day to start and the day to end? And all those gifts that the sunlight, the rain, uh, and all these things supposedly happen by themselves. God help them. Who is the father? Who is the father of the rain? And who hath begotten the drops of dew? Who condensed the air into clouds and bade them carry the waters of the rain? 
now bringing gold tinted clouds from the north, now changing these into one uniform appearance, and again transforming them into manifold circles and other shapes. Who can number the clouds in wisdom? Whereof in Job it saith, and he knoweth the separations of the clouds, that bent down the heaven to the earth, and he who numbereth the clouds in wisdom, and the cloud is not rent under him. For so many measures of waters lie under the clouds, yet they are not rent, but come down with all good order upon the earth. Who bringeth the winds out of their treasuries? And who, as we said before, is he that hath begotten the drops of dew? And out of whose womb cometh the ice? For its substance is like water, and its strength like stone. And at one time the water becomes snow like wool, at another time it ministers to him who scattereth the mist like ashes, and at another time it is changed into a stony substance, since he governs the waters as he will. Its nature is uniform, and its action manifold in force. Water becomes in vines wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and in olives oil that maketh man's face, face to shine, and is transformed also into bread that strengtheneth man's heart, and into fruits of all kinds which he hath created. What should have been the effect of these wonders? Should the Creator have been blasphemed, or worshipped rather? And so far I have said, I have said noticing of the unseen works of his wisdom. And so far I have said noticing of the unseen works of his wisdom. Observe, I pray you, the spring and the flowers of every kind in all their likeness still diverse one from another. The deepest crimson of the rose and the purest whiteness of the lily. For these spring from the same rain and the same earth, and who makes them to differ? Who fashions them? Observe, pray, the exact care. From the one substance of the tree there is part for shelter and part for diverse fruits, and the artificer is one. Of the same vine part is, of this of the same vine part is for burning, and part for shoots, and part for leaves, and part for tendrils, and part for clusters. Admire also the great thickness of the knots which run run around which run run round the reed as the artificer hath made them. From one and the same earth come forth creeping things, and wild beasts, and cattle, and trees, and food, and gold, and silver, and brass, and iron, and stone. The nature of the waters is but one, yet from it come, comes the substance of fishes and of birds. Whereby, as the former swim in the waters, so the birds fly in the air. This great and wide sea, therein are things creeping innumerable. Who can describe the beauty of the fishes that are therein? Who can describe the greatness of the whales and the nature of its amphibious animals, how they live both on dry land and in the waters? Who can tell the depth of the uh, who can tell the depth and the breadth of the sea or the force of its enormous waves? Yet it stays at its bounds because of him who said, hitherto thou uh, hitherto shalt thou come and no further, but within thyself shall thy waves be broken. Which, which sea also clearly sorry which sea also clearly shows the word of the command imposed upon it since after it has run up it leaves upon the beach a visible line made by the waves showing as it were to those who see it that it has not passed its appointed bounds who can discern the nature of the birds of the air how some carry with them a voice of melody and others are variegated with all man manner of painting of painting on their wings, and others fly up into midair and float motionless as the hawk. For by the divine command, the hawk spreadeth out his wings and floateth motionless, looking towards the south. What man can behold the eagle's lofty flight? If the, if then thou canst not canst not discern the soaring of the most senseless of the birds, how wouldst thou understand the Maker of all? Who among men knows even the names of all wild beasts? Or who can accurately discern the physiology of each? But if of the wild beasts we know not even the mere names, how shall we comprehend the maker of them? God's command was but one, which said, Let the earth bring forth wild beasts and cattle and creeping things after their kinds and from one earth by one command have sprung, and from one earth by one command have sprung diverse natures the gentle sheep and the carnivorous lion and various instincts of irrational animals, 
bearing resemblance to the various characters of men, the fox to manifest the craft that is in men, and the snake the venomous treachery of friends, and the neighing horse the wantonness of young men, and the, and the laborious ant to arouse the sluggish and the dull. For when a man passes his youth in idleness, then he is instructed by the irrational animals, being reproved by the divine scripture, saying, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, see and emulate her ways, and become wiser than she. For when thou seest her treasuring up her food in good season, imitate her, and treasure up for thyself fruits of good works for the world to come. And again, go to the bee, and learn how industrious she is, how, hovering round all kinds of flowers, she collects her honey for thy benefit, that thou also, by ranging over the holy scriptures, mayest lay hold of salvation for thyself, and being filled with them, mayest say, How sweet are thy words unto my throat, yea, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb unto my mouth. Is not then the artificer worthy the rather to be glorified? For, for what? If thou knowest not the nature of all things, do the things that have been made forthwith become useless? Canst thou know the, the efficacy, uh, efficacy of all herbs? Or canst thou learn all the benefit which proceeds from every animal? Here now, even from venomous adders, have come antidotes for the pr preservation of men. But thou wilt say to me, the snake is terrible. Fear thou the Lord, and it shall not be able to hurt thee. A scorpion stings. Fear the Lord, and it shall not sting thee. A lion is bloodthirsty. Fear thou the Lord, and he shall lie down beside thee, as by Daniel. But truly wonderful also is the action of the animals, how some, as the scorpion, have the sharpness in a sting, and others have their power in their teeth, and others do battle with their claws, while the basilisk's power is his gaze. So then from this varied workmanship understand the Creator's power. But these things perhaps thou knowest not, Thou wouldst have nothing in common with the creatures which are without thee. Enter now into thyself, and from thine own nature consider its artificer. What is there to find fault with in the framing of thy body? Be master of thyself, and nothing evil shall proceed from, from any of thy members. Adam was at first without clothing in paradise with Eve, but it was not because of his members that he, he, that he deserved to be cast out. The members then are not the cause of sin, but they who use their members amiss, and the maker thereof is wise. Who prepared the recesses that sorry, who prepared the recesses of the womb for childbearing? Who gave life to the lifeless thing within it? Who knitted us with sinews and bones, and clothed us with skin and flesh, and as soon as the child was born, brought streams of milk out of the breasts? How grows the babe into a boy, and the boy into a youth, and then into a man? and still the same, passes again into an old man, while no one notices the exact change from day to day. Of the food, how is one part changed into blood, and another separated for excretion, and another, and, and another part changed into flesh? Who gives to the heart its unceasing motion? Who wisely guarded the tenderness of the eyes with the, with the fence of the eyelids? For as to the complicated and wondrous contrivance of the eyes, the voluminous books of the physicians hardly give us explanation. Who distributes the one breath to the whole body? Thou seest, O man, the artificer, thou seest the wise creator. These points, these points my discourse has now treated at large, having left out many, yea, ten thousand other things, and especially things incorporeal and invisible, that thou mayest abhor those who blaspheme the wise and good artificer, and from what is spoken and read, and whatever thou canst thyself discover, discover or conceive, from the greatness and beauty of the creatures mayest proportionate, proportionably see the maker of them, and bending the knee with godly reverence to the maker of the worlds, the worlds I mean of sense and thought, both visible and invisible, thou mayest with a grateful and holy tongue, with unwearied lips and heart, praise God and say, How wonderful are thy works, O Lord, in wisdom as thou made them all. For to thee belongeth honour and glory and majesty, both now and throughout all ages. Amen. Uh, Father Joseph, um, did you have any thoughts to share? Pretty much everything he has written there is quoting, or at least echoing, the divine scriptures. 
And I mean, there's just echo after echo in it. The point that comes across now is evolution. The, the modern world essentially discounts or just basically eliminates the, the creator that the, the all of creation just forms itself through chance and through uh, the natural selection and, and giving of advantage. But uh, there have been a number of refutations on that. And the St. Cyril is writing a long time ago, and his, his commentary basically covers all the ground that refutes evolution. So don't get tied up with evolution and think, well, yeah, that can be made Christian and so forth. And a lot of so-called Christians in the Roman Catholic Church in particular it has tried to do that. They're, they're saying, well, you know, evolution is, is all possible and so forth. And I've even heard this among Orthodox. Uh, but the, the problem with all of that is evolution ultimately denies a creator. And if you're going to go that route, then then you basically have no God. All of creation speaks about uh, God, but the person that refuses to accept, refuses to accept even the obvious. I wanted to make another point, I guess. Uh, again, you know, he's writing, I forget exactly when he lived, but it's, you know, the fourth, fifth or sixth century, somewhere in that time frame. So it's like 1600 years ago. Um, and his understanding of natural processes, when he's talking about the clouds and the rain and, and all of these things, it's there's a lot of knowledge there. And again, the, the worldly wise will attempt to say, well, all those people in the past, they, they knew nothing. It's only through our scientific methods and our, our recent discoveries and so forth that we can we can really understand creation and they will disparage those who've come before them. But you read this and, and it's not ignorant. It's there's a lot of knowledge here and a lot of wisdom.